afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Can you all hear me? Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's lecture. It is my pleasure, my great pleasure, to introduce to you once again Hilary Guys, who has lectured at summer school before. So there are many here who are quite familiar with her work. So let me just say a few words about Hilary. She's told me not to make it too long because she wants to get down to, the bus to business. But for those of you who for whom it's the first time, uh, let me just say that Hilary is a South African-born Briti so African British art historian who has lectured at the National Gallery, the Courtauld Institute, the Tate Britain, the Tate Modern, the British Museum, the University of Cambridge. She has toured widely in the US, including the Smithsonian Institute. She is currently on the faculty of Florida State University. She is also a trained painter and exhibits regularly, mostly in Berlin, France, and the UK. Let us welcome her. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, dear Cape Town. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting summer school. And of course, thank you for supporting me. I think we, we all feel that it would be rather wonderful if we could find an abandoned garden, a bit overgrown, a bit neglected, and we could go in there and take all our burdens, the things that are unshareable, and leave them there, and that will work. And maybe it's for that reason that heaven in nearly all cultures has been conceived of as a garden. Yeah, we know that life's a beach, but then heaven's a garden. And we're going to have three days, we're going to have three days to think about flowers, when we're going to forget all about all the stresses of the world, that are winding us up so much. If you were to see this wonderful tulip, perhaps the size of the Empire State Building or the size of the Eiffel Tower, you'd be blown away by the absolutely amazing um, engineering of it, the sheer shape, the color, and the beauty of it. And, um, sorry, I've just seen my friend leave. I'm wondering if she's upset. Perhaps she's gone to find the garden straight away. <laughs> um, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the ancient times of the ancient Egyptians, could I just ask you please all to f turn off your phones? There's one emphatic rule. There are no mobile phones in the walled garden. So we're in this tangled, abandoned garden. We've left our burdens there, and everything's going to work for the next three days. And the ancient Egyptians were so much in love with the idea of gardens that you even had to have a garden after you died. Did you know that? And they made gardens for the afterlife. So here is a beautiful garden that you could see, and they hadn't quite cracked the problem of perspective, so they didn't know what to do with the trees down here which are that upright, while well, those ones are side ones, and as you can see, a problem. But you see, all the trees are full of fruit. There are palm trees with dates, and, and there are ducks, and there are fish, and there are um, lotuses in the pond, and even a gardener in the corner. So right from the very ancient times, the Egyptians believed very much in the healing power of plants, and indeed of colors. So if we move from Egypt, oh no, I wanted to say before that, because Egypt is largely a desert, it reminded me that we cannot have a garden without water. I know that's going to ring very deeply. This wonderful fresco from ancient Egypt shows a little slave 
dipping his bucket down into the pond with his faithful dog at his heel and drawing up the water. And just for the three who came in, I want to say, life's a beach, but heaven's a garden. Right? And we're going there for the next three days. Thinking about deserts and water and how water gushes up from nowhere and how Moses struck a rock to get water, I was reminded of the words of Isaiah from Isaiah 35. Water will gush forth from the wilderness and streams in the desert and burning sand will become a pool. The thirsty ground, bubbling springs and the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And in this lovely wall painting in Egypt, you can see the papyrus and the reeds and the waterfowl flying up, and yet you can see no water at all. But trust me, the water is there. The water gushing forth is a great image in the Old Testament, a metaphor for, 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 for fullness, for, for life-giving fullness. So we go from that very dry beginning, remembering that we can't do a garden without water, to an island that is awash with water and surrounded by the sea, and that was Minoan Crete. And look at this beautiful and wonderful um, painting from 1630 BC, 1630 BC, showing the bluebird fresco from the garden at the palace of Knossos. And when you see the wateriness of the flow of all the, the, the plants here, this is water flowing up, when you see that, you feel that this has to be Chinese. It surely looks very Eastern, does it not to you? Yeah, it does. And we always say that everything came from the East, but maybe it went the other way. Maybe it went the other way. So this, you can feel the sense of the tides washing in on the shore, the wind blowing, and everything that an island experiences compared to the dryness of Egypt. So the Minoan the Minoans had a very profound influence on the island of Santorini, which was called Tira. And if we go to Akrotira in Santorini, we see more of the very same plants that we saw in Egypt. They're now called Minoan seed daffodils, but they are actually papyrus. And we're looking at 1630 BC, at the papyrus fresco from the room of the ladies. And of course, there may have been a river under here, we don't know. So all the way through the Minoan culture, the Mycenaean culture, there is always the sense of water and plants growing and birds. And with the Egyptians, we also include very many birds. As you can see in the middle of this beautiful low relief, a fantastic hoopoe up there, and right down below, the Egyptian ibis that we often saw at our cottage at Betty's Bay. And between the ibis and the hoopoe, you see the wonderful lotus flowers, which are deeply sacred to the ancient Egyptians. You see, the blue lotus was very sacred because it was thought to sink below the water at night and rise up in the day. And therefore, it was an image of rebirth and resurrection. The color blue was also sacred because the, it's the color of invisibility and of the subterranean world. And indeed, the bodies of Isis and Osiris were painted blue. Blue was also the color of the breath of God, which went on to be very important in Greek culture. The pneumotheu, the breath of God that you have in your lungs. And the blue lotus then has all of these associations. Plus, it gave on a very, very faint aroma, but you had to be trained to smell it. It was so faint. The lotus, in addition to all of this, really symbolized Egypt's triumph over the floods. And you see it as such a beautiful thing with these assegai petals and the great yellow burst, almost like a burst of sunlight coming from the middle as it floats on the dark water. And as we begin these lectures with the concept of water, we are going to end them on Wednesday afternoon also with the concept of water. And this, this sacred lotus has a secret, which is that it contains a psychoactive alkaloid, which is called an apomorphin, 
which was known to both the Mayans and to the ancient Egyptians. And it produces a sedating effect. I don't know if it's like uh, morphine or not. But very recently, that's 2009, several countries, including Russia, Poland, and Latvia, have claimed, called it a class A drug, and you can go to prison for 15 years if you have it. So that's the downside. But now we're going to leave the gardens of ancient Egypt and the Minoans and go to a subterranean secret garden. And this garden was built for the Empress Livia, who was married to Augustus, the first Roman Emperor Augustus. Livia was actually married to somebody else. Um, and she had one child, and she was three days off delivering the second child when she fell in love with Octavian. And three days after the delivery of the child, she married Octavian, who became Augustus. So Livia built a beautiful subterranean garden, and it had no windows or doors because of the threats of assassination. And you look at this very simple branch. It is incredible everything the Egyptians didn't do, the Romans could do in terms of turning the forms around, in terms of allowing the light to creep behind it. These leaves are in silhouette, whereas these leaves have the light on them. And you have the sense of the folding in of light among the leaves. And it's the most, I've been there, it's the most extraordinary experience to walk around this and imagine that the Empress Levy herself would sit there every day. And she constructed it behind a wall. So it's built behind a low wall and weeds are on the outside to create the illusion of reality. So you can see the weeds coming up here along the outside. And a dear little dove who's been perched there, cooing away, waiting for her mate for about 2,000 years, which is a bit sad, really. She reminds me of Beatrice, my, my tame dove at home, actually. But when you think about the flowers, so, of course, roses, because Livia wanted her garden to be beautifully scented, and the marvelous depth, the sense of forest that you can't penetrate. Perhaps this is the blackbird that sings at the break of day, except he hasn't quite got a, he might have had a yellow beak once, and maybe a jay down here. But the sense that there is a misty depth, and it may be early morning, or it may be late in the evening, but the light is filtering through this forest. Up here, the light again, there's almost a slight breeze turning the leaves over. And on this side, you can see so many birds as you look way deeply, deeply into the depth of the forest. And looking at the branch of pomegranates, remembering my pool when I was young, and the birds at home here in Cape Town, I wondered if certain words came to your mind as well. I was just thinking about how we feel when we hear birdsong in, in a forest or in a garden. And these were the words that came to mind. Already with thee, tender is the night. And happily the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the bough, but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. I wonder if John Keats, so young, age 26, and dying in Rome, saw these gardens and remembered the ode that he'd written so recently on Hampstead Heath before he went down to Rome to die. And we go from these subterranean gardens to gardens that are buried in ash. And these are the gardens that were found under the volcanic eruption of Vesuvius. So we're looking at Flora. She's the personification of spring. And she walks through the garden, picking her flowers with her robe cat fetchingly draped off one shoulder. She must know that somebody's looking at her behind. And this is from the Villa Ariana. And it's from the first century. And you can see here quite a different sense of, of figures and space already. 
Right down there in Pompeii, in the house of the golden bracelet, there is another lovely dove. And she sits by a little fountain that is the shape of a shell. But all around the fountain, you see plants that you probably can recognize. I think this looks like a cycad here. It doesn't, it's too rigid looking for a fern, and it's got a very stiff, to me that looks like a cycad. And then you've got on this side here a rose. There's a rose up here. And this could be an oleander, perhaps, a laurier rose, I'm not sure. These look like chamomiles. And you can see quite a lot of plants. Um, there looks like a, a plane tree up there that you will recognize even today. The thought of the bubbling spring, or the overflowing vase, as it's known in the Babylonian mythology, is very, very ancient and very significant. And the dove coming there, she really does look like Beatrice. She truly does. Um, but where's Bertie is what we want to know. I've had to leave them at home. Maybe I could bring him to Cape Town next time. So she's there, and she survived a very long time. Of course, the garden has a snake. You're all waiting for that, weren't you? Were you on your toes? You know, there's going to be a snake in the garden, isn't there? Uh, this snake is winding up in order to reach the figs. And figs were always had a pagan overtone in art. Figs. You know, you break them over, they're very juicy, and one thing another. So when we see the tree with the, with the serpent winding up it, that takes me straight back to the golden light of sunset, the very edge of the world, beyond the Atlas Mountains, at the very end of Oceanus, the world ocean, where the Hesperides leave, live. And the Hesperides, then, are these Greek nymphs. They're the nymphs of the evening and of that special golden light. And they were the daughters. They were called the daughters of the evening. So they tend a blissful garden in the very western corner of the world, and there is a great serpent that winds itself around their tree. This is just an Italian vase that you see here, Italian Greek. And there's always a snake around the tree. But when you garden in the Hesperides, you take everything off, and you sit in the sun, you look at yourself in a mirror, <laughs> and you rather hope that a, dish, a rather handsome bloke turns up, which does actually happen in very conveniently in the myth. So you're now looking at a 5th century hudria, which is a wine jug, a big wine jug, and this one was attributed to the Hesperides painter from the 5th century BC, made in the Keramikos in Athens. And you see on this vase Heracles, right by the tree, talking to one of the, uh, the Hesperides with the snake winding up the tree between them. Quite appropriate, because it's a hudria, and that is a vessel that carried water. So this man, the woman, the tree, and the serpent takes us seamlessly straight to the Judeo-Christian tradition of Genesis. So we see the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And of all the paintings I know, this one, it has, it has to be this one by Lucas Kranach in the Courtauld Collection. Um, you see them there on a wonderful morning. It's beautifully bright and clear, peaceful. And all the animals are there in pairs except for the lamb. The lamb is not there in a pair because the lamb is there as a symbol. The lamb is trapped in the tines of the antler, the way that Christ will be trapped in the crown of thorns. In fact, the lamb represents the Christ, whereas an Adam is... Christ, and there is Adam. So Adam and, and the Lamb are both in this image of the crown of thorns. Anyway, there's a lot more to say, but based, just to say here that it, the tree in the middle is the axis mundi. It's, it's, the, it's the axis of the world. The roots go down into the subterranean world, the trunk comes up through our world, and the trees go up into heaven. And of course, it's loaded with wonderful fruit. Come a little bit closer, and you see the serpent in the tree, and Eve handing over the apple, as she has to do, and lifting her arm in rather a fetching way. This would have been considered very racy in the 15th century. <laughs> well, Adam clearly has doubts about whether he should do this thing. 
And naturally, uh, Lucas Cranach, you see that we're now in the Protestant North, um, you know, is thinking, well, it's not really Adam's fault. But I want to show this detail. It shows how beautiful the tree and the fruit are. I'm afraid that Eve is a bit blurry, as one would be at this moment. As she offers, I like the hand gesture. She's saying, well, what about it? Well, of course, after all of that, it's everything's wonderful in the garden for quite a long time. But the Bible doesn't tell you that. So you have Lucas Cranach the Elder. He starts to paint these paintings of nudes in the garden, usually by fountains. And you can see by looking at her, although she's not called Eve, she's, her identity is veiled behind the name uh, Rivenev. Fact is, he knows nothing at all about the classical canon. This figure doesn't seem to have any proper um, skeleton at all. It just goes everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a bit like Play-Doh. Uh, sorry, I'm terribly sorry to be so rude. But it has got that sense that it hasn't got structure because we are in the north and he wasn't, he wasn't aware of the classical canon. And I think she looks, I don't know, I think she looks like a very bored waitress who doesn't want to take your order. <laughs> Mind you, the storm clouds are gathering, as you can see. So he made another one 15 years later, where again, the proportions are completely off, because the head is very small, you have this immensely long body, sort of strewn out across the grass. And she's looking out of the corner of her eye rather smugly. But we've still got the fountain, and one more, just to show you how very popular the theme was. However, I'm afraid it was all over rather soon, and the angel of the Lord expelled humans from paradise. And there's the angel of the Lord um, shooing Adam and Eve, they're holding hands, it's rather sweet, or are they not holding hands, um, out of the garden, and in the front you get a flashback to the reason. Now you see that Eve is taking no chances, she has two apples, <laughs> and in fact the serpent, just in case Eve drops one, has another two apples. <laughs> Um, and the, the serpent very cleverly is balancing on her... Well, the snakes don't have tails. I don't know what she's balancing on. Um, right again, this marvellous tree. There's really only one tree, you see. It's the same tree. It's the tree at the beginning, and it's the tree at the end, and then it's the tree in the middle. The tree at the beginning, the axis mundi, the tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of knowledge, Nobody's against knowledge. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the tree of, of, of life at the end of the whole story, the tree in the center of the city of God. And then in the middle, of course, the dead tree on the dry mound. Um, this is also Cranach telling the whole story. And you see God the Father fully dressed in nicely woven robes, even though none of that's been invented, but that's fine. This is art. Explaining to Adam and Eve the consequences of what will happen. So uh, we found that in Flanders and in Holland there were quite a few artists that really enjoyed um, interpreting um, the Garden of Eden. And this one that you're looking at by Jan Bruegel, Jan Bruegel the Elder, is referencing the classical myth of the judgment of Paris. You see right here Adam and Eve, but Eve is sort of doing her classical, she's pretending to be Venus, you can see Contraposto, and, and he is in the position of Paris offering her the golden apple. So that's quite an interesting little invasion of, of the pagan world coming in. But in the middle, the Axis Mundi is a massive tree going up through the middle of the landscape. The next one is painted on copper, which I thought was rather nice, and it's in the king's bedroom in Windsor Castle. And here we have very many more animals where we find that Adam and Eve are no longer the be-all and end-all. Adam and Eve are somewhere over there. They don't really matter all that much. Um, there, was an, there was a backstory, may I say, to these great paintings about the Garden of Eden that gave you an opportunity to include very many animals and very many wild animals that people in Europe had not seen. And the, the, the subtext was that the great kings and emperors uh, and rulers of Europe at the time wished to show their people the reach of their power. 
And so they collected exotic animals in places like the Jardin des Plantes in Paris in order to demonstrate the reach of their control. If nobody's heard about Zarafa, the one good thing I'm doing this week is to tell you about Zarafa. Please get her. Zarafa is a girl, a little girl. Um, she was a girl giraffe a baby, she had two cows of her own for milk, and the poor soul had to walk all the way from the source of the Blue Nile all the way to Paris. She went on to a few boats here and there, but everywhere she went, every mayor of every French town fell madly, madly in love with her. When she got to Paris, people started to wear hats a la giraffe and cloaks a la giraffe, and she was the bee's knees, but she was very lonely and she died in Paris. So she was one of the examples of animals going back. Hmm? Uh, this is actually an unknown naive painter. I put it in because it is so naive. And you see that the snake knows where to go and is bee lining for Adam standing here looking at Eve. Now all of this is, we are in this wonderful idea and it's such a simple idea. It's such a very simple idea that please turn off all your phones. It's such a simple idea that we all lived in a wonderful place until we did something wrong. Um, how about if it did have real roots? Now, a scholar in London, at University College London, has made a big study of the possible original location that inspired the story in Genesis of the Garden of Eden. And I've just called this the original Garden of Eden. So David Roll at UCL London has suggested that it could be between this lake here, this lake here, and the Caspian Sea between Turkey and Persia and Iran. And that area is, is, is formed into... Please, could we, t would you like to, please, could we turn off all our phones? Thanks. It completely breaks the magic. <laughs> Never mind, we are now trying to find the real Garden of Eden. And these are some of the facts. So that in 1999, the ruins of an ancient garden were found 16 kilometers from the Persian city of Tabriz. And David Roll, in this um, in, this, uh, in this journal, the Jerusalem Report, in a particular article called Paradise Found, said, as you descend a narrow mountain path, you see a handful of beautiful, you, sorry, you see a beautiful alpine valley, just like the Bible describes it, with terraces of orchards on its slopes, crowded with every kind of fruit-laden tree. And in the biblical word Gan, as in Gan Eden, means walled garden. Rose says the valley is indeed walled by high, towering mountains, the highest of which is a volcanic snow-capped mountain, which is now extinct, which he identifies as the prophet Ezekiel's mountain of God, where the Lord resides among red-hot coals, as in Ezekiel 28. He also says that cascading down the mountain, exactly echoing Ezekiel, is a little river, meaning bitter river, and that, that people... Um, attribute magical powers to the water of this river. So he also suggests volcanic ash from the mountain would have made the ground very rich and therefore the valley very fertile. So that is a possibility to think about. And here is an actual photograph of the valley as it is today that might have been the enclosed valley which inspired the Gan Eden uh, story in Genesis. And this is the actual river that is mentioned that rises from the headwaters in Eden. But in Persia, Persia is described as a spring garden. And in this wonderful image, you see the mountains at the back, all volcanic. And that the whole place is like a garden, full of flowers and animals. And of course, in the Persian rugs, you see gardens over and over and over again. This is a beautiful rug from Isfahan of the Paradise Garden and you see that the Paradise Garden has a square pond of water in the middle of it right there, 
And the water goes out to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And you can see all the trees on the edge of the water, the ripples on the water, and you can even see fish swimming in the water. It's an absolutely beautiful rug. But it wasn't only on the rugs that they portrayed the wonderful paradise garden. It was also on the tiles in the mosques. And I, couldn't, I didn't take a whole wall. I've just got one tile to show you a really beautiful poppy seed head on the mosque in Istanbul, one of the mosques. So when you were in Persia as a princess, you would relax in your garden with your hat to shade your beautiful white skin. And there would be a beautiful a bottle of wine and a cup and a pond and a tree. And looking at that, how could we not think about the words of the Rubaiyat of Makayam, which was written um, in the 11th and early 12th century. And come fill the cup, and in the fire of spring, your winter garment of repentance fling. The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing. Makayam, it was translated by Edward Fitzgerald, and first published at the end of the 19th century. By about 20 years later, it was the be all and end all of every single educated person's bookshelf. So we leave the Persian gardens now and come to the flowery gardens of Europe. And um, when we think about Europe, we cannot but think about Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was the first queen of France and later became queen of England, who with her daughter, Marie was credited with developing the whole idea of courtly love, which softened the entire culture of those very dark ages, you know, which was overrun with barbaric barons fighting. And the, 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 the whole principles of courtly love uh, brought a feminine touch. Eleanor's grandfather had been a troubadour, and he spent, she spent her childhood reading poetry, listening to music, and appreciating the arts at the court of Aquitaine. In this miniature, you see a man and woman presumably plighting their troth under a rose tree while she holds a little puppy in her arms, rather nice. So the walled garden is a very, very big um, feature of culture in the Middle Ages, not only in the castles, but very much in the literature and in the miniatures. And this is a, a miniature that illustrates um, Boccaccio, it shows Amelia in her garden from a little novella by Boccaccio that Carol will probably know off by heart. And you see her sitting there surrounded by a fence of white and red roses. And in front, there are actually pinks. Can you see these? Little pinks all the way around there. And the sense that you can walk around. So it does take something from the idea of the cloister, that you would walk around in your walled garden. Of course, she has extravagant blonde hair, which makes her very beautiful, very desirable. The walled garden itself becomes a metaphor for wisdom. The walled garden was a very important visual literary metaphor, both in the medieval manuscripts and in texts and in the miniatures that illustrated them. The Compendia of Knowledge had titles that always related to gardens of flowers. I think it's rather nice. The flowers then were gems of knowledge that grew within the orderly environment of the garden. And you can see there is the garden and a scholar is going to be led through the gate into the garden to, to, to absorb the wisdom. This is a really beautiful miniature from the Upper Rhine and it shows a garden of paradise. And all these medieval gardens that I'm showing you, they have a sort of Edenic flavor. They are all related to the idea of Eden. We look at this lovely garden here, and you can see lots of things happening. The Virgin is sitting, reading a book up here. Um, down here, somebody is scooping water out of a trough, and we have some people have angels down here. Angels mix quite naturally with normal people in the Middle Ages. Nobody is surprised if an angel shows up. I think we should try and be a bit more like that. And we may just not actually have to expect them to have 
wings. They might feel awkward with wings in the modern world, but it doesn't matter. They still show up a lot. So here they are, sitting down, mixing and matching with ordinary people. And all around the edge, somebody's picking. You can see different flowers that I'm sure you will recognize. I can't see that, because I'm, but you can see the irises up here. There are all kinds of flowers all the way around. And then there was the Romance of the Rose, a very famous romance, which had a great impact on the whole culture of the idea of the walled garden. And in this poem, it was really an allegory of courtly love. And the lover, in the quest for the rose, his beloved, arrives at a beautiful orchard enclosed by a high wall. And this is the walled garden of the god of love. The garden contains wonderful burgeoning plants, but its walls carried images of suffering. And when I was reading about this, I was really touched to find that C.S. Lewis always taught about this when he was up at Oxford. Um, a nice picture of the Garden of Pleasure, where you see the young man being led through the door, and he appears again inside. And you have the overflowing fountain, which, as I think I mentioned, it comes from ancient Babylon, and it's a symbol of the overflowing vase, of the abundance, if you like, of, of life. It's like life, light and water pouring out. It usually pours out in four streams, but in this case, it's not. It's just pouring out, basically. And to come a bit closer, this is a miniature, this is a detail from British Library to show how civilized you played your lute, you sang, you read poetry, and you learned about love. The Madonna of the Rose Garden, we're a little bit further ahead now, we're to the beginning of the 15th century. Um, a traditional theme again, showing the Madonna of the Child in an enclosure of roses. The idea of the enclosure becomes again a metaphor for the Virgin herself. And in this very beautiful miniature with the gold background, we can see very many things going on. We find there are angels, maybe I can go a bit closer. We can find angels are dragging along a basket of rose petals, which are very heavy, presumably. You have this angel offering a palm frond to St. Catherine. Um, St. Catherine has been, she's a princess. She's a princess of Alexandria. She refused to marry the emperor Maxentius. And so she was killed on a, on a wheel, but she didn't die. So she was beheaded, and you can see the sword here. So she's been offered the, the martyr's palm. And on either side, you see peacocks. And peacocks, again, go way back to Hera, the wife of Zeus, and to Juno, the wife of Jupiter. And then they become an image for the Virgin Mary. And people believed in the ancient world that peacock flesh did not corrupt when it died. So peacocks became an image of immortality. And you'll frequently see a peacock around wherever you see the Virgin Mary. So if you go back a bit, you will also see this fountain here, which again, another metaphor for the Virgin, it's the spring of grace. Um, gardens then go on to a much larger scale when we see them in the beautiful tapestries of the Mealflow tapestries um, made in the Middle Ages. And this one is a detail from the unicorn tapestry. The art of tapestry garden is completely wonderful. All the plants are set against a deep, dark background, and they're all different. You look in the foreground, and you probably see quite a lot of plants than you recognize. The unicorn, sadly, has been caught. And it's very sad that if you look closely, you see the unicorn is bleeding. It's very upsetting. Um, what's quite interesting is a slight element of perspective in that the back corral has light on it and the front doesn't, so that you get a sense of your eye going back. The Christian writers interpreted the unicorn and the unicorn's death particularly here as the passion of Christ. The unicorn in captivity with a thousand gentians, carnations, irises, and daisies, and right in the very, very front, a very significant iris. That is because the iris is an image of, of suffering. There's the iris, see it in a little bit more detail. Uh, the flower here on the left was quite a new flower that had only recently come into Europe. It's a clove pink carnation. 
Um, these tapestries are absolutely amazing. This is in New York, and this is the Bath of the Falcon. And again, the flowers are there, absolutely everywhere, surrounding this courtly scene of a pet falcon being given his bath. Now, the olive branch, when we come to plants individually, um, the olive branch, of course, is so ancient and so wonderful, and the olive oil itself is practically sacred. As you know, it certainly was in ancient Greece, in a way. And here we have an angel with his hand on his chest, holding out the olive branch, um, perhaps reminding us or triggering a memory of those words from one of the Psalms, Psalm 91, I think, not quite sure. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And Hans Memling has the angel so quiet holding the olive branch there. It, of course, becomes a symbol of peace. But it isn't always, because in ancient Rome, in ancient Greece, in ancient Greece, the olive crown was the thing that you won if you were a victor at the Olympic Games. And the crown of olive leaves had to be cut by a special boy with special golden scissors from, from Zeus's sacred grove, and the olive uh, was sacred to Zeus. But they also wore olive crowns at parties. So this is a magnificent golden, um, but you see you have the sense that it's to do with victory. As we move into Christian era, the olive branch is associated with the idea of peace, and the, it's in the beak of the holy dove. Um, this is rather a lovely early burial. It's a front of a burial uh, plaque from the catacombs. Uh, the man there is praying. Well, that's how you pray. Nobody prays like this. So that is the way you pray. And there comes the dove. And we have here its meaning, which is peace, with the word erine written right there in Greek. When, uh, when Gabriel comes to bring the news of the incarnation, um, Gabriel is flying down from heaven, and Gabriel's cloak flies up in a very Baroque manner. But wait a bit, we're not in the Baroque, we're not in the Renaissance. That's been done very daring to give the sense that wind is blowing Gabriel's cloak up. And this is by an amazing, on part of an amazing panel by Simone Martini. So Gabriel there, Gabriel, in Hebrew, it means God is my strength. And it's interesting that here he's coming with the olive branch, not with the lilies, as he does later. The lilies are there in the background. So that is the entire amazing altarpiece by Simone Martini, made in 1333. That's the actual lily that we think of as the Madonna lily. And there's a beautiful myth about this lily, which I'm going to tell you in a second. When Filippo Lippi tells the same story, Filippo Lippi has Gabriel carrying the lily, and the lilies are then again here in the vase. Gabriel comes in through the garden of many flowers, and there is the wall around it. So this hortus conclusus, the walled garden, symbolizes the virgin's purity. She is the walled garden. She is the hortus. She is the secret garden, in fact. And then there is the door, the closed door that you can see there, the, um, hortus, the, the porta clausa, which again symbolizes the virginity. And Gabriel comes down and says, um, he says, um, you have found favor with God, I think. She says, Emmanuel, be, let it be under, so be it unto your word. I'm so sorry, but I, I can't remember the exact words. Be it unto me according to your word. So that is as Philippo Lippi. And Philippo Lippi had run off with a, ma a nun aged about 15, and he was about 55. And the, 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 po the Pope really, really ought to have excommunicated both of them. And there's a whole backstory to it. But because he was such a wonderful painter, you know he'd been an orphan, and he was a cross-race orphan, and he should never have been a monk anyway. He spent all his money on his amours. But he went, and so this little thing of the Annunciation, it had a personal resonance for him, because he was going to have a baby too, as an old monk of 50-something. So this painting, which is the same, just I won't put this in because a bit more symbolism, I wanted to tell you about Nazareth. You know, we always say Nazareth, Nazareth, it's done and dusted, it's a Roman town, isn't it? 
But Nazareth meant branch or twig in Hebrew. And it alluded to the words in Isaiah, a, a twig will come from the stem of Jesse, a root will come from the branch of Jesse. Again, I'm afraid I haven't rehearsed those particular words. But it is about the Old Testament, the idea of the tree of Jesse. And that was Christ-centered. During the Middle Ages, there was an enormous rise of Mary, a rise of, of Mary um, almost as co-redeemer. And so Nazareth was translated in medieval French as garden. And when Nazareth became flowery garden, it clearly alluded to the Virgin Mary, who is the secret garden. And therefore, the whole thing swung. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So that's just about how translations can change things. You can look at it's Isaiah 11 or something. Just check it out. So, so this is a painting by Zenobi Strozzi. And again, you have the walled garden, everything that I've told you about, including the, the, the cross in the door there and the, well, the spring of living water. Um, the point about the, 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 about the lily is that the lily links to Eve in a really wonderful way. The myth says that when Eve was expelled, and you see it in this work here by Frangelico, as Eve is expelled from the garden there, she wept. And as she wept, her tears fell to the ground, and up grew the white lily that became the symbol of the Virgin. And that's a beautiful piece of poetic folding in of an idea. And this lovely work by Frangelico, which is in the convent of San Marco in Florence, so I've seen that, uh, uh, Frangelico gets rid of the vases and the lilies and the, and the olive branches. Keep it simple. There's nothing, just space. And the great arches of blue made of lapis lazuli, which is that, which was more expensive than gold, came all the way from Afghanistan. The Virgin is swathed in blue because she is resting in the wisdom of God, because that deep blue in the mystical tradition of Christian art symbolizes the deep and secret wisdom of God that is mentioned in the book of Job and also referred to by St. Paul. You see, you have to remember that you can't read. Nobody here can read anything. You're illiterate. And in the medieval world, everybody was illiterate. So pictures had to do a lot more than simply tell you the, the, the basic story. These, these monks that made these things imbued the paintings with levels and levels of, of meaning. I love this painting. I don't dare go there because I always have to have a big box of hankies. It is amazing. It's in the National Gallery in Edinburgh. And, um, and it shows Sandra Botticelli's amazing painting in the privacy behind a hedge of roses, the virgin looks at the baby who is asleep on her cloak. The imagery of the baby sleeping on the cloak comes from um, Flanders, but that's irrelevant really here. And all around her are the pink roses. Behind her is a towering pile of rocks, which just happen to take up the form of a cross. When you look at the virgin, as she looks down like that, you also see that the star of Bethlehem rests on her shoulder. And you see that the blue, pink rose, for Botticelli, the pink rose is the Virgin's most important symbol. And you look at it and you wonder about the baby. Is the baby asleep or something else? It's the most extraordinary painting. So the rose, they've got the lily, but the Virgin then is also symbolized by the rose, very much so in the Renaissance. And always, so this is a rose window. It's from the north transept of Notre Dame in Paris, and it is the life of the Virgin. And you look at that, you barely can see it because there's so much there. But the rose symbolized then the unfolding of the soul towards God as the light comes through. That's why it has to be a window. Quite wonderfully, we actually know the, the, the master of stained glass. We know him by name. Incredible then. These amazing windows are just something else because they're full of sacred geometry and the numbers that had a metaphysical significance were used throughout the construction of the Gothic cathedrals in every part of the cathedral. They had a metaphysical meaning and occult power and they were used everywhere, particularly in the windows. Of course, the unity of all things then is expressed by the circle 
That's why the windows run. Um, you see here Botticelli, age 23, allows us to go behind the hedge. Um, we're now behind the rose hedge. The rose is still there, identifying the Virgin. And how do we know that we are there? We're, she's not on a throne or in a church or surrounded by angels. She's behind a hedge and we're there. But how do we know that? Well, we know it because John is looking at us. John is drawing us in by looking at us. Um, Botticelli is 23 years old when he made this, and it was made for the Medici. You can see their symbol. Uh, so the carnation is also important. It's a symbol of marriage and love, and we're in real uh, Renaissance mode in this painting because we have symmetry, balance, and geometry, the key features of Renaissance, and the red carnation there symbolizing um, love and, and marriage. This is a Milanese painter, therefore you've got more red and green. It's a bit closer to, to the Flemish painters. And I really rather like this very, very small and beautiful work by Roger van der Weyden. Again, the whole virgin is covered entirely in red and holds up the red carnation. And the red then is, again, one of those mystical colors symbolizing God's divine love which pours from the throne of God. So this whole painting, if it hasn't faded, was probably even redder. So we come to England and the idea of flowers and poetry. And um, I love this very, very famous miniature in the Victorian Albert Museum by Nicholas Hilliard. So we're now well and truly into the English Renaissance. And you see him with his hand on his heart. He's probably in love. He may have written off a little sonnet. And the beautiful roses showing up against his black cloak. But obviously, now that we're here, um, and for the sake of various friends who are in this room, we have to talk about Shakespeare. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grow, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses, and with eglantine, there sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. Midsummer Night's Dream, of course. But this portrait you're looking at is the only extant portrait that was made during his lifetime and has only very recently been properly um, attested and identified. And so do look at this. You are probably the first people in Africa to see this portrait, and he's not bald and he's not old. He's young and lovely with a very delicate and sensitive face. He was very interested in plants, and at nearly 50 different specimens have been identified in his plays and poetry. And the last and the greatest secret garden of all, before that harsh light of the Renaissance blows them all away, is surely Botticelli's Primavera. And this famous image Zephyrus surprises Hamadryad, who is the wood nymph of the forest, and whisks her away into the world of spirit. And as she opens her mouth, she speaks flowers. The, here we have Flora stepping into what is an allegorical garden. All of these flowers, they represent the spirits of heroes who have died. And there are over 500 identified plant species depicted in Botticelli's La Primavera, with about 190 different flowers, of which 130 are actually named. And you see the painting, the whole painting, it, the, this painting was made as a wedding gift for Pier Francesco de Medici. And it, it shows you the, the abundance of the spring with the dance of life, the dance of all that is going on, and the, root, the, the trees are all full of the oranges, which are a symbol of the Medici. Um, there are so many theories about it. I did two lectures on Botticelli. Did anybody come to them? Well, well this, is, this is all Neoplatonic philosophy. I cannot go into it because I haven't got time. But this whole thing is about the soul entering the world and being caught up in the world and then going on and being whisked back. Let's use Shakespeare again as we look at the amazing face of Flora with those grey-green eyes and all these dear little flowers 
Shall I, compare thee, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease has, ha has, has all too short a date. And often, in his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long as, so long as lives this, this gives life to thee. One of his great sonnets. The old-fashioned pink rose, then, is even embroidered on her dress. As we imagine, here is Flora. She's gathering up the roses in her skirt, and she's going to throw them. She's not putting roses into her throat. Into her, she's gathering up the roses in her skirt, and she's going to throw them. But where is she going to throw them? She's going to throw them into the next painting. <laughs> it's very interesting. Now, if by any chance you don't have your own walled garden, and you don't happen to have a secret garden. You could invent one in any old deserted palace that you come across. You could simply make your own. And you could do something like this on the walls of a deserted manor or palace, to be rather nice. So I'm now leaving you with the thought of heaven and Eden, the water springing up in the desert, through Isaiah, and bubbling up as springs, and then the, the walled garden of courtly love, and all the imagery of the high medieval period, and then into the poetry of the Renaissance. So I'm leaving you in this wonderful, invented garden, and I'll see you tomorrow at half past three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please, could we please remember, could we please remember, please remember to turn off our phones tomorrow, because I will probably forget to remind you.